Happy New Year, Courtsiders. Welcome to 2019, and we're starting the new year with a fantastic podcast. So without further ado, my name is Andy Burns. My guest today is Naomi Cavaday, and this is the Courtside Podcast. Right then, let's make a uh, let's make a start. So, welcome to Courtside. I'm in the uh, luxurious surroundings of Pret in Pimlico, but I have with me uh, Naomi Cavaday, uh, British former number three. There's a there's a claim to fame, and now even higher claim to fame with the co-host on Tennisish podcast. Is that the highest yes. pinnacle of your career so far, being on tennis-ish? <laughs> it, it, quite possibly. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's definitely, it's, it's been filled with ups and downs and all of the mixed emotions of being a professional tennis player, I think, I think so. so. <laughs> We've only been doing it a few months, but, uh, but yeah, tennis is, uh, it, it's a, a huge amount of fun. It's, oh. it's not, not much stress, really, I'm only, I'm only joking. That's all right. Well, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm fearful that during this podcast I might sound like a stalker, because I do listen, so uh, please don't. But one of, one of those areas is... I I'm aware that you like your shortbread and are famous for making it. So I dived in yesterday and made some shortbread for the very first time. So uh. first, <laughs> I just need to get a test. You, no you, way. You don't have to eat, well, that much of it, actually. It's I mean, that, that is a huge slab of shortbread. It oh, is. Def- can I have it? I'll have please, a bit. Please have a, please have a okay, try. Okay, right. Okay, this is, this well, is live now. pop a bit off of the it's end. It's still got a bit of crunch. <laughs> let's see how this goes. No, it's great. Is that okay? Very buttery. Yes. Yeah. Very good. I like that a lot. Great. I'm going to take some home. Is that okay? <laughs> that's all right. You're not just saying that because we're recording. No, no. no? That's very good. Well, uh, that, that, that was one of four pieces that were okay. The other, the surrounding edges <laughs> um, were fed to the proverbial dog. <laughs> that's right. I, I was, uh, I didn't actually realize with, with shortbread how much it kind of oozes and expands when it, as it cooks. Ah. It kind of spread. That might be in the excessive amount of butter. Yeah, it might have been the butter. That, <laughs> that. But you can, ta- you can taste very buttery. But that's what shortbread should be, exactly. right? Short exactly. and buttery. That's, exactly. that's the whole thing. Well, uh, if you want to pass it on to Gigi, if she would like to try some, more than happy to. Okay, I, w- I, I will. She's not a fan of shortbread. I'm aware. She says it's too short and too buttery. So <laughs> I, think, I think you may have the same issues I did, but <laughs> we'll give it a go. I'm a big believer in nudge theory, so let's keep the pressure going. One day, you never know. You never know. So, so welcome to Courtside. As a way of uh, an introduction to, to some of our listeners, can you just give a, a background of who are you, where you're from, what, what's your involvement in the whole world of tennis? Yes, so um, I'm Naomi. I hi. used hi. <laughs> I used to be um, a professional tennis player. Uh, I played for a, a few years, uh, and I stopped when I was about 21 years old. And uh, uh, so it was quite quite young, really. Yeah. So I had quite a short career, probably from about 15, 16 through to 21. Uh, and then I, I've done a lot of coaching since then. Um, worked with lots of juniors, done yeah. bits of traveling around the world in, in, in that capacity. Uh, and now my main focus is media work. So um, anything to do with broadcasting, really. So um, I describe myself as a commentator and I commentate on the tennis all through the year. Yeah. Work for anyone and every everyone. So people get sick of me <laughs> listening to my voice I guess um, but I'm really I'm really lucky it's a, it's an amazing gig it's um it, it's great just to sit and, and, and watch and talk about the sport that I love so much and right. uh, and out of that of course uh, co-hosting the podcast which is tennis yeah. with which I do with Gigi um, which keeps me pretty busy uh, and I still do a bit of coaching as well okay. so, uh, but it's just mainly more broadcasting for the moment I've flipped it it was mainly coaching with a little bit of commentary thrown in and i've just flipped it for the time being so um from a commentator's perspective which of the four grand slams is the best one to commentate from oh um does this put you in conflict responses now no (laughs) it doesn't at all um but i hadn't actually really thought about that not from a commentator's because as soon as you said which of the best which of the four grand slams immediately i was just about to shout wimbledon at you um, and I have to say Wimbledon okay. because it, it just it, it's, uh, but it's it's not really an unbiased view because so I have so much history with the tournament and so much emotion connected yeah. with being there. 
So um, I suppose it's a little bit unfair. I mean, I've competed in all of the slams, but of course Wimbledon holds some, some fantastic memories for me. And I, I just always find myself when I go there as a commentator with a... Um, especially if I'm on a match on centre court and I kind of have this overwhelming sense of pride when I walk or watch somebody walk out on centre yeah. court say Joe Conta is going out and I just think well I did that that's yeah. that's bizarre isn't it how did I do that because I'm looking at that now thinking I couldn't do that um <laughs> So that's why I think, yeah, I think the love will always have to be there for that one. And is, is being a commentator, has that kept the love of the sport alive for you? Does it make you lament for what, not playing at that level anymore? Or are you still in, are you, do you enjoy the commentator? Has that supplemented it well enough? Or does it still leave you with a little bit of lament when you watch them walk out? Would you like to be holding the racket instead of the microphone? I think there is a, there's a, a, a very small amount of wanting to be doing it yeah. as I mentioned I, I did stop very young um, but I think it's the same for anyone who stops at any stage of their career whether you stop due to injury or illness or um, because you're just done with it or because you've come to the end of your career and you're, you're too old really to continue or you just want to do something else with your life there are all these different reasons why people stop and I think everybody's going to have a bit of just that that want to be out there. It's just been such a massive part of your life, and it's quite heartbreaking when yeah. you have to break away from it. It's yeah. it's, a, it's a really emotional, very difficult time. So, um, yeah, I do have a moderate amount of that, but um, commentating absolutely helps because I'm involved to the sport with the sport to the highest level yeah. still, uh, and and that's brilliant for me. It's great. So tell us a bit about your journey in tennis, you know, so I've got down, you, you know, you, you reached career high of 174 in the world. That's a, that's a phenomenal, we, I was, Elijah and I were chatting uh, yesterday and I said, oh, I'm going to meet a, a lady called uh, Naomi Cavendish. she got to 174 in the world. He's like, wow. Because <laughs> we'd, we'd previously been having this conversation about, which as 11 year olds often do, how high do you think in the world I'll get? Because when you're 11, you can become Rafa. Mm. Um, <clears throat> And so then you hit that interesting tension point as a parent of going, not wanting to burst a bubble of hopes and dreams and aspiration, but also not wanting him to feel, unless he makes top 10, dad's never pleased. And uh, so I said, could you imagine getting in the top thousand of all the millions who play? So I'm trying tentatively to dodge the guy. And he's like, no, that's not high enough. I'm like, 500? And so, uh, so when I said, oh, I was meeting yourself today, I said, you got to 174. Went, that's a good number. Okay. So you now put aspiration onto an 11 year old. He dreams of being <laughs> number 174. <laughs> well, I, I, I will wait for the day where I get a WhatsApp saying that he has yeah, overtaken my number. I, that's, that's great. Actually, a good friend of mine who is a player, um, Harriet Dart, yeah. uh, that w I was waiting, waiting for that day. And she was so close. She was hovering around it for about a year. And I was like, I was just sitting there, paying patiently waiting and as soon as she bursts through it she has done now she's smashed yeah. it but as soon as she bursts through it I was like yes yes that's exactly what I was waiting for um but it's nice but you know what it doesn't matter what number you are at the time it feels not great yeah just you always want more you always you're just as soon as you achieve something you're looking to the next thing yeah. um it's only in time with reflection and I think in a in a lot of time um because even when I went into the coaching world I, I went straight in yeah didn't necessarily feel like I'd actually achieved that much um, but then now when I yeah now I spend more time kind of meeting people from outside the world of tennis because you were just I was just in this bubble so everybody knew who I was and what I'd done so it didn't really feel uh, that impressive when you meet new people and they they ask you they go through the, the questions as to what you do and that sort of thing it, it, it turns out oh, yeah, it's pretty cool so I'm, I'm I'm happy enough kind of um, being proud of what I've what I've done. Yeah, it's all right. And one, one of those, uh, I guess, high points would be playing the likes of Venus uh, at Wimbledon. So we've got we've got a uh, the the theme tune for the podcast is dreaming of Wimbledon, whereas you didn't just dream it, you played it, and it was centre court. Yeah. Against one of the big greats in tennis, full stop. Um, <clears throat> as someone who doesn't even know what it's like to anticipate playing for his school at any sport, I have no <laughs> frame of reference to know what it's like building up to any sporting event. Uh, I did my 25 metre certificate, but that's about as high as we've got. What was it like for yourself building up to such a match like that? Well, it's, it's, it's such a long process. It's yeah. such a culmination of everything you've done for so many years. Um, and I think... It, it, it's odd being Brit British because, as you say, I was ranked about 170, 180 yeah. at the time. And 
but you're treated as if you're in the top 10 yeah. for the one week of Wimbledon. Yeah. I mean, if you're still in, in the second week of Wimbledon, you're probably in the top 10 anyway, yes. right? So you're Joe Conta. But being British, you have that week, uh, and, it, and it is quite bizarre. Uh, the attention, the focus, the amount of media requests. Is through. I mean, look, you know, we're no Kay Nishikuri, that's yeah, for sure. Yeah. But it, it is, it's absolutely extraordinary. So you're trying to take it all in your stride, but there are so many layers to that match because as a wild card, you are either the lowest ranked player in the tournament, which I was a couple of yeah. times, or you are one of the lowest ranked players <laughs> in the tournament. Um, and uh, and to and to get the big matches that I did, including playing Venus, she was defending champion. Wow. It was in two thousand and eight, so we knew we were on centre court yeah. on the tu- opening on the Tuesday. Um, it, I mean, you have to try and take it all in your stride, but the tennis is such a such an ask because I don't normally compete against people like Venus. Yeah. It's not a normal thing mm. for me to be doing. Um, I don't normally play in arenas like Centre Court. So that was another element to deal with. Uh, and then you've got the, the atmosphere, the people around you, f- you, the differences from your friends and family, the differences from uh, the governing body or from uh, from the media, and how that can sometimes infiltrate your own team and some, yeah. sometimes they can start acting differently. So there are so many elements that are just completely out of your comfort zone. And, and, and I mean, really all I can say is you just got to cope with it. And that's it. You, you, you've got to try and, and cope and at the end of it, just be able to play tennis. And that was my whole thing was just through all of that mess of complicated, bizarre situations, so abnormal to be in. And I, I mean, I should say I was uh, when I played Venus, that was my third year at Wimbledon. So I would have been 19. Yeah. So pretty young. Yeah. Um, a bit fearless. Yes and yes and no. That's the thing. There's elements where you're fierce. I think within your game, you're very much kind of like, well, wow, let's have a swing. Once I won the first game, I was okay because you know, two things was I want to win the game. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want and I want to get past the hour mark. Um, but those those two concerns aren't. They're not really real. They're, it's more. You, you have all these nerves and you have to do something yeah. with them. So I kind of put them on these silly little things of, oh, I hope it lasts an hour and I hope it win a game. I hope I win a game. I mean, the fact of the matter is, if you go out there not believing you can win the match, yeah. you are going to get humiliated. So I didn't believe either of those things, but you have to do something with all these, these nerves and the energy you've got and, and you do have worries. Uh, so I just kind of put it all on those silly little things and I'd be sitting around going, oh, I hope I win a game. I, I knew I was going to win a game, but as I say, it's not not really a real thing. But um, yeah, it was uh, yeah an extraordinary ex- experience, and and um, I just wanted to do myself justice yeah. because I'd worked hard, I'd put my whole life into this. This was a huge passion of mine, yeah. um, and and you know what? You can be a top fifty player, a, a solid top fifty player for fifteen years, as a, as a lot of players are the international players, and you can have never played on centre yeah. court. Exactly. It, it, it's a very, very rare thing. So trying to, I don't know, soak it up and all of this stuff. But then as I think about it now, I feel like it was somebody else who did it. I can't really grasp onto it. But I mean, what an awesome experience. Yeah, but the first serve, did it go in? Uh, it was her service game, first Is game. Is that a good thing to do? I'm advising Elijah at the moment because he serve, he's only 11. It's not the strongest thing in the world. Um, <clears throat> to let the other person serve first because then at least he's had one game of just, ah, I'm in the game. Whereas there's a lot of pressure on the first one, or is it, do you find it's better to serve first because, I don't know, I've got it over with, or? I think it really should just be, uh, for me, I just advise it's up to how you feel. If you walk on the court and you're hit with nerves, then then absolutely try and return first. It's kind of a free game, although it doesn't really work like that, does it? Especially in junior tennis, you don't often hold your serve the whole way through. (laughs) Unless your kid's six foot five, I'm not sure. it's not. (laughs) That would be bizarre. Um, so yeah, I think if um, yeah, if you're feeling good and you're feeling confident, I don't know, maybe you're through to the semi-final mm. and you've been serving great all week, then serve yeah. first, right? I think just keep it flexible. I don't think many people have a hard and fast rule unless they are a big server. And then if you ever hear them elect to return, you can you can pretty be pretty confident that they are not yeah. feeling very good about yeah, their yeah. game. <laughs> so what's it like? I he is a genuine uh, nerdy and. Uh, here's a nerdy question. Does a return from Venus feel different from a return from another tennis player? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's just, 
just because I mean as I say uh, she was the best player in the world at the time she wasn't number one but she was the defending champion yeah. and as Venus and Serena were doing around that time they weren't playing huge amounts of tournaments but they were just winning all the grand slams yeah. um, she actually went on and won it that year as well so she defended her title beating Serena in the final so uh, as I say it was playing the best player out there um, Oh, it's, it's 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 just it was just extraordinary. Like I mean, in the warm up, she was just standing. I mean, I had a big serve, yeah. and actually in that match, I hit the fastest serve of the tournament. Uh, I think it was at one eighteen or something. And people talk to me afterwards, and just because you bring up returns yeah. is why I'm going to talk about it. Because people you say to me, because at the end of the year they bring out the list of the top fifteen fastest serves or something yeah. like that. Anyway, so I was in the list, and it was kind of funny because everybody in the top fifteen fastest serves of the year is kind of in the top twenty, uh, and then there's me at 174, <laughs> uh, having having fired down a big one. And so then, so people were talking to me about it at the end of the year, like, hey, you know, you made the list, and I just found it hilarious because I was like, did you see what happened? <laughs> I went flat down the tee. I, I, I've got a lefty. I'm a yeah. lefty. So I went flat down the tee on the outside into the forehand side, 118 miles an hour. She returned it inside the baseline and hit a winner. <laughs> so I just went back to slicing into the body. I was like, I'm not doing that again. That is that is madness. <laughs> I only did it once. Yes. I probably could have hit one harder, to be honest, if I'd have kept going. But no, no, I was, you know, it's, it's not all about pace. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's it just quite funny. I mean, she just re she was just returning so far up the court. I've ne I'd never experienced anything like it. I have a, a pacey and swingy lefty serve. It's always been very tricky for people. Uh, and to have somebody standing a meter inside the, the baseline. And in the warm up, she was totally psyching me out. She was just in a meter inside the baseline, just crunching my serves everywhere. And I was just thinking, because my plan before the match was okay she's got long levers let's try and curl it into the body tuck her up she doesn't like that and you can you can jam her up um and then in the warm-up she was just dealing with it all so comfortably and i was just thinking okay i can't remember what the plan b was but uh, <laughs> i don't know we'll see how we go it wasn't hitting it flat down the <laughs> tee because i hit that serve and i looked at my coach who was you know going just don't do that <laughs> we talked about this don't do that so you get you get those high points in your in your life, or maybe not when you saw the ball come back to you. But you get those high points in your life. But yet there's the journey that you went on leading up to playing in those matches. There's the stuff of uh, ITFs. There's the, there's challenges. There's future tournaments and all the rest of it. And there's quite a few people who listen to the podcast who've commented. You know, some of their kids are starting tent, you know a little bit on that journey. Uh, and we went to a, a challenger this year out in Barcelona and loved it. But there's hardly anybody there. I'm like you don't get to see much live sport. But there's not. Um, uh, uh, and it was a fantastic. We, we went there for the four weekend. Loved it. What, what's what's it like for you as a player? Because as your average tennis punter will see Wimbledon, they'll see the Aussie Open, whatever, as these big things in lights. And yet there's this almost this other circuit going on that not many people engage in. Is that an enjoyable experience playing in that? Is it a bit disheartening sometimes? Is it? I don't know. I think. I mean, I can't speak for everyone. Uh, that's for sure. And I think everybody responds to it differently. Yeah very very few people I think we're talking uh, less than 5% of players enjoy the circuit yeah. and, and would say that I love doing this and actually if I just stay at 300 for my entire career and I'm out here playing if they can fund it which yeah, is a, that's, that's that's a, a massive question because you're not earning much money at, at all um, so if they if that's not an obstacle for them uh, there are very few people there are plenty of people who have lots of money in the world and very few people choose to s sit on the circuit yeah. <laughs> you know it's a, it, you have to work too hard to be at such a not a low level in terms of the, le the standard of play mm. because it's through the roof yeah, and people was, really yeah. should go out and, and, and watch it because I think it's phenomenal um, but you're, you're having to work so extraordinarily hard to uh, not get any sort of reward yeah. Um, and it's, it's very difficult it's, so, it's very difficult so does it favour almost the ones who break through very early because then they can get the momentum going because it seemed like when I watched particularly on the challenge like, here these I mean they're exceptional players it was great tennis to watch but what are, you know as with layman eyes you guys are, are amazing to watch uh, how do you get from there to the next stage up because you can't afford that coach and I imagine you can't afford all that much coaching time anyhow. You probably don't have a physio with you looking after you physically. So it almost feels like, is there a ability, do you just get trapped? 
do you need a lucky break or does talent genuinely rise to the top or would talent get stuck because there's, they just can't afford to get the additional coaching to get them to the next level? Um, it's, it's fascinating, actually. I, I think that in general, I would say that talent will rise yeah. through. Um, up, up, and I, but I'd say a limit is probably 250. Mm. Players rank between 250 and 100. You could pick any of them and yeah. they could get to the top 20. Yeah. I have, I have no doubt about it. There's nobody that you're. If you turn up to watch Wimbledon qualifying, which everybody should do, yep, uh, if you if you if you turn up to watch events like that where you've got players ranked between 100 and 220 playing, as I say, you could pick out the next Angelique Kerber. They're all there, all of them. Everybody's capable. Everybody's got the skills, um, and uh, it, it's just about who's going to go and do it. And I mean, so Kerber is somebody. That she's she's a year above me, and I played against her in Wimbledon qualifying, and I actually beat her, yeah. and. Uh, and I, I've, I've known her growing up and she was talking to me after the match talking about how um, oh uh, you know, well, you know I'm, I'm, I'm 21 now and you know I'm kind of maybe I'm a bit past it because we were the back end of the era if you, have, if you haven't made it by a teenager yeah. for, the, for the women then you were kind of done and, and she was saying oh you know I don't know what to do and, and these sorts of things. she wasn't talking about stopping no. but she was obviously talking about that she's really having to consider what she's doing because sitting at 180 uh, it's, it was just not an option. Um, it was seen as a you know such a such a failure, I guess. Um, and then uh, three years later, she won a slam. I think it was yeah. uh, three years later. Oh, three years later, she was in the top ten. Um, and 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 you know, I, I played Kerber. It, it could have just as easily been Kerber as it could have been a anyone in that tournament. R really, it could be. But it's about who's going to go and do it. Uh, and there are a lot of people who you get a group of people who know what the work is to get there mm. and they decide they don't want to do it yeah. and get a group of people who just have no idea yeah. and that's maybe lack of coaching lack of information lack of knowledge they're the players that maybe mm -hmm. have suffered from not having people around um, but, but whatever it is I mean the, op the opportunity is there well there you go there you go give some hope to some of, some of the parents listening there yeah. particularly for, for their kids as they, as they start start on it we've got um, three of on uh, I think it was episode nine when we had uh, Tabatso and CC and Paige who are at our academy. They're, they've just been playing in some ITF uh, over in South Africa. Two of them are South African. I think it was a cheap way of going home for Christmas. Uh, but um, they've just been playing that and the experience you're getting a little bit of WhatsApp messages back from them saying what an experience. I mean they played a great level in Barcelona then all of a sudden they went here and went all right. Uh, and what was encouraging was the messaging back wasn't all right. It was mm. right game on. And there's that desire to kind of mm. I've seen the next level. I, I've played the next level. Yeah. Now, I, now I know what. I, now I, I know what I need to do to play at that level. Am I? Do I want it? And yeah. That's an encouraging thing for them this year. Well, that that's it. And, and so many times when you when you play against somebody and you and you lose to somebody who's better than yep. you, you, it could be two and two. You could not get many games on the board at all. But you can. The amount of times you can come off and be like. I can do that. Yeah. Just give me three months, yeah. and if we if we do that exactly again, I can do it. Trouble is, is the player you're playing against will be three months better as well. But <laughs> but you, but that but it is great because I think that's such an important important thing, and it is so crucial to get out to see each level up because you need to see something uh, that is hard and real yeah. and physical in front of you. Because I I find particularly uh, you know in the landscape of British tennis, which is where I work, where I where I operate, or I have done as a coach, um, coaches and players see maybe British nationals and they see Wimbledon and then they kind of guess the in-between bit yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. they think that it's a steady progression. So they see a forehand at nationals and a forehand at Wimbledon and think that, well, depending on your ranking, your forehand will get incrementally better as your ranking would increase. Yeah. And it's just nonsense. Yeah. Everybody has great forehands and backhands and serves and all, all this sort of stuff. Practice. Uh, exactly, <laughs> right? Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I just think that it, it's, um, it's such, a, such an important thing is to get out, see tournaments, see those levels, those challenger yeah. levels, which are, are, are <laughs> you know, they're, they're really difficult. I found it very difficult. And I must say, I finished my... Probably, I was probably about 18 months in. So I finished uh, 18 months into being a professional tennis player. So yeah. I started in like the, the summer after I did my GCSEs at school at 16. Yeah. So I went full time. How did your careers advisor take that one? <laughs> man, man told me to become an electrician. You know what? 
all anybody said to me was, "What, what if it doesn't work out?" Yeah. Like I, and I just, I just said, "I think I'll be fine. Like it probably won't work out. That's, that's all right." Not a great way to um, live, is it? What if it doesn't work out? Okay, let's hold myself back. No, and 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 I, and I must say that, that that's a very British thing. It is. And when I do a lot of comparison work between nations, that because you know, we are. We, the kids that play tennis in our country tend to be from privileged backgrounds yep. tend to yep. that is changing which is fantastic yep. but in general it's an expensive sport uh, and in other countries it's not that expensive that's just the way that it is um, but there are other countries like America and Australia who all, they, those players tend to come from privileged backgrounds and uh, it, it, it is, a, it is a, a fascinating thing looking at the comparison but the biggest thing with American youngsters and Australian youngsters and their culture is that they they like confident kids. Yeah. They like ambition. They yeah. like dreams. Dreams is such a big thing in America. The amount of time people say to children in America, kind of, you know, what, what's your dream? Yeah. It's such a common thing, and actually, yeah. it's encouraged. And uh, as I say, in, in Britain, it's just it's so the opposite. It's, what do you mean dream? Get your head out of the clouds and get back to reality yeah. and deal with life, right? Um, uh, it's something that, uh, for me, I think it's possibly the biggest thing that holds us back yes. as a nation in terms of performers. Um, but quite tough to change or tackle <laughs> to be honest you can only really operate in your own little circle there um, but uh, but yeah it, it's uh, it's fascinating what were we talking about I don't know what were we saying I can't remember when you went after your careers advisor at 16 oh yeah yeah so 16 so I've been playing like 18 months and I, I finished the following year and I, I think I was around about 220 yeah and I said to my coach at the time, and I've been 18 months I've been playing, I said to my coach at the time, if I'm not out of this level soon, as in within the next year, yeah. I can't do it. There are, pl there are plenty of players. It, some, for some people, it takes five years to break through. They have to sit on the circuit for five years. Do you know what? We're, we're now 10 years on from, from my career. Yeah. And uh, more and more, you're going to have to sit on the circuit for longer because the average age of breaking through to the top 100 is becoming later and later and later. <laughs> Uh, so players are expected to sit on the ITF circuit even if you leave school at 18 yep. five years on the circuit you're only 23 Kerber broke through at 23 so did Conta yep. um, and for me that was just never a possibility uh, I just uh, I had already said very early on that I can't do that whatever this is I just can't keep doing it. And at the time, our top Brits for the women's side were ranked about 180. We had three about 180. Um, no one any higher at all. So it was it was pretty weak. And I was quite close to that. And and they those particular players happened to have been stuck at the challenger level for a few years. And actually, it paid off because a couple of them then broke through to the top 50. Yeah. Uh, and actually and a couple others go through to the top 100 so actually all of them ended up having tremendous success um, but I just said what they're doing I can't do it and it was not because I didn't believe they could achieve what they then achieved I wasn't that surprised to be honest um, but it was just if you're telling me now that it's going to take me five years I just don't have that in me because I find I found it really hard it really affected me I, I, being permanently jet lagged it's just exhausting, you know, being on your own a lot, traveling all the time, having no sort of stability in your life, losing every single week. Yep. Every single week you lose. Um, was, uh, you know, I could deal with it fine. I wasn't a particularly sore loser. It didn't, there are some people I know it affects them for days. Mm. It, it wasn't like that for me, but it's just, it's relentless. You just have that sinking feeling kind of quite consistently. But for me, mainly, it was the travel. Yeah. It was just, it was very, very difficult. Uh, it's just an awful lot of flying. Yes. Get your miles, get your frequent flying miles up? <laughs> Not no. really. No one it's told me about it. <laughs> no one told me that you could do that. I didn't, had no idea. What do you want to cash them in for? Strings and uh, overdrives? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but then the flip side, I was just thinking there, as you say, then full credit to you, to, to those players who must have for many years looked at the likes of Serena and Venus, who must look at Roger and Rafa and go, when are you going to retire? Because they, they've just got such a hold. And the next lot coming through, they're, they're having to bide your time. I mean, when I started watching tennis, quite a few years ago, I won't reveal the staggering age I'm at now. But, you know, when, when you had players winning it at 18 and 19 at Wimbledon, you're like, right. So I always had the mentality of when you got to 23, 24, that was it. And now you've got 
the likes of Serena going on into her 30s mm. and Roger the same like, and they still look fresh and incredibly fit and incredibly hungry mm. for the sport and yeah. it's, a, it's, a tri- it's, it's a testament to the way they've looked after themselves and their love for the sport but then it's also a testament to the other players behind going I still love it enough to cling on yeah. and my time will come well that that crop of players the, the, the mid 30s yeah. somethings uh, that we've got at the moment of course you've got Venus Serena uh, Roger, I mean, for Venus, I know she's had a slightly weaker year this year, but last year she was in the final yeah, of the slams, and it, I mean, it's extraordinary. Um, they caught, for me, I, I'm not taking any responsibility away from them. They are phenomenal people and athletes, but this, I don't think it's any sort of, I mean, Serena and Roger, born in the same year, they're both 81s. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think, I mean, two of the greatest athletes of all time happen to be from the same uh, year and a lot of the greatest athletes of all time across a lot of sports come from a very similar era. I was um, born in the 70s, that's why I just couldn't make it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that must have been it. That must have been it. Um, so, um, and uh, yeah, but it, 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 I, I think that they got the wave of sports science getting yeah. involved, looking after their bodies. Yeah. Very, very important. Um, training much more efficiently, training smarter because of all the technology that was coming along. Uh, but also they were around before before computer games yeah. and the internet and distractions yeah. came around. Um, I don't know. It's, it's a theory that I've heard knocked around a couple of times and it seems like there's something in it. But, um, but uh, yeah, it, it's phenomenal. But, but unfortunately, there are a finite amount of jobs in tennis. That's very true. Um, fortunately, it, it, it's increasing slowly. I mean, yep. I'd probably say we've got 150 on the women's side and 200 on the men's side. But um, think about how hard it is to become a doctor. Yeah. I think how many thousands and thousands of doctors yeah. there are around the world. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not easy. There are tens of thousands of kids trying, right? Yep, there are quite a few. There are one or two who all keep dreaming the dreams as well. Um, just wanted, I wanted to ask uh, some questions around because one of the one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you, apart from just about your uh, tennis uh, history and your experience in tennis and, and shortbread, uh, is it's also kind of mental health and well-being because you're an ambassador for the LTA mm. uh, on that, and it's an area that my wife and I have, uh, have been involved in for many many years. Run a run a charity working and supporting young people. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why we uh, love the sport of tennis because of what it does for our little one. Uh, we've got that little one. Always getting, I need to stop calling him that. He's getting taller. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's more than just a forehand he's getting. It's, he's growing and the sport is nurturing him. But in, in an article you wrote in the Huffington Post a couple of years back, look at this, me doing research. I'm almost turning into a pro. Um, <laughs> it said this, um, I was diagnosed with uh, depression when I was 18, uh, but of course I had been struggling with it for many years. It was no coincidence that my mental health started to suffer as I began to experience great success in my career as a tennis player. I was struggling to cope with the demands and expectations uh, on, of life on the tour. So I guess some of the questions I'd just like to explore, because particularly for us as parents, there is uh, our paramount concern is always the well-being of our kids. Sure. And Lisa, I'm going to make an assumption that all parents are like that. I'm, going to, yeah. I'm always going to believe that way. And so uh, I'd love to kind of explore this whole thing of, of well-being and sport because it's being very personal to yourself. It's something that's, that has affected you. And so we hear a lot within sport of constantly the positives of sport, health uh, and well-being. But there, are, there, is a, there is a negative side that often can come out of sport where sport is either a trigger for catalyzes either poor mental health or if you're struggling with your mental health exacerbates it what 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 are your thoughts and reflections around mental health and sport that's a huge and open question uh, maybe too open but what are your uh, reflections around that whole theme area that we need to be so aware of as parents as we invite our kids to play a sport that initially they say they love that could actually cause them harm it's um it's complex yeah. really I mean it's very difficult to unpick and even if I just look at my own experiences trying to figure out what caused what and it is quite is quite challenging I think um, the first thing is really the awareness as parents that um, high achievers yeah. in any walk of life are a very vulnerable group of young people young people who are high achievers yeah. uh, are very vulnerable actually I I think they were, they were rating categories, uh, I think they're the second highest um, in terms of suffering with some sort of mental health mm. issue. Um, 
and it, it's intrinsically linked because I think you kind of to to have the sort of drive and uh, and also to be attracted to play a sport an individual sport yes. where you get you take all of the glory and all of the devastation uh, it takes a particular sort of person I just hated team sports I just yeah. couldn't I can't understand the mentality <laughs> of standing there and watching somebody else take a penalty for you and then celebrating like it's that but that you didn't do that <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand um, so I, I've always been naturally attracted to, to individual sports so I do think that tennis more than other sports actually <laughs> naturally uh, has players and athletes in it that, that, that are susceptible yeah um, it's it's a it's a fascinating one. I mean, if I talk from my own experience, yeah, it for me everything happened so fast. I actually was nowhere near the top of the sport when I was a youngster. I was a county player. I played for Kent. I love playing for Kent. Always have done. But at 14 years old, I lost in qualifying for 14s nationals. Right. Love and love. Yeah. In the first round of qualifying, and. Do you know what? That was a bit of an underachievement. I probably would have hoped to have qualified, mm-hmm. but that, but no more than that. And if you think there's top 32 players playing in nationals, right? So, uh, and most of the time, governing bodies tend to look at the top three or four in each age group. So, I mean, I'm way away from where, uh, you know, where anybody who wanted to be a professional tennis player was. And, and as much as I wanted to be a professional tennis player, I didn't think it was going to happen because so many people had told me, well, you're not in the top three. Yep. You haven't had the funding. You haven't played all these international competitions. All I'd done was play some British events. I, I was only playing twice a week until I was 13, 12 yep. or 13. Twice a week and maybe a competition or here or there. So uh, it, just, it just wasn't expected. But then in a two-year period... Really, I think what I found was I found my love for working hard. Uh-huh. I'd always been scared of working hard. I'd always been kind of, what fitness are we doing tomorrow? What, what Are we running? I don't want to run. Like, I don't want to be tired, you know. I'd always kind of just be worried about that sort of thing. And then um, I learned to let that go, and I was just working very hard. And then by 16, I was top in the country. I'd basically won everything that was on offer that yeah. year. Clay courts, summer nationals, winter nationals. I think I'd have probably only lost a couple of times that year. And I used to lose all the time. I used to do a lot of losing. Um, and, uh, and it was a phenomenal year. And then I get this phone call from, from the LTA, our gov- governing body, saying, do you want to come and play full time? You know, sit your GCSEs and then come down to Queen's Club, which is where our National Tennis Centre was. We'll pay for everything. I hadn't had much funding. I'd had some county funding and, yep. and like a few hundred quid here or there. But the top players were getting at the time we're getting school fees paid for and international trips and full-time coaches I mean, we're talking tens of thousands if not six figures in terms of funding uh i wasn't one of, i mean as i say a 500 quid which was very nice and it was great and it paid for a lot of individual lessons or whatever else it did um but and most of that came through the county anyway um and uh and yes yeah, so i said yes yeah, sure so i went and i became a pro uh, and then, so I, I played nationals and I, and I won that was in the August. And then in September, I went to India and played a couple of 10Ks and I'd never played them. So it's the first level of professional events. I qualified and lost in the first round of the first one. Uh, and, and I was supposed to be doing a five week block. And it was going to be two 10Ks in India and then three low level uh, junior events in Indonesia after that. So it was a five week thing. And I did not like the idea of five weeks right from the beginning I'd never done it before but I just didn't like it and after the first tournament I qualified I think I won a round so I picked up a couple of points which was great for the first time you've ever played a tournament to actually pick up points I mean that's amazing and I remember phoning uh, the head of women's tennis back in London at the time and I said you know what look I don't want to do the full trip I want to do these two tournaments in India and then I want to come home Uh, and and I what I was trying to say, bear in mind I'm only 16, right? Yep. What I was trying to say was five weeks is going to be stressful and I don't think playing the junior events, grade fours, grade fives, was worth that stress. I mean, I, you know, if, if you're doing a grand slam, you can kind of stomach doing a four or five week trip for that. Yep. It was just kind of, it just wasn't worth it for me. I just c- couldn't quite figure it out. Uh, but obviously the response I got was kind of, oh yeah, you know, you picked up a couple of points. You think you're Billy Big Boots now, do yep. you? Right? Uh, and he said to me, I tell you what, if you win next week, you can come home. 
and I was in qualifying. It was my second ever professional tournament, and uh, and I was like, well, that's obviously not going to happen. So that's ridiculous. And he said, look, you think you're too good to go and play these junior tournaments, which was it was kind of what I was trying to say, but not really. It was yeah. more just kind of. Um, Look, if it was three more 10Ks, I'd probably... I, I, I don't know. Maybe I was being a bit arrogant. Probably. Uh, who knows? Uh, anyway, the long and short of it is I wanted to come home that much that I qualified and won the tournament. <laughs> and I walked off the court after I shook hands as they were setting up the ceremony. I was in Pune. I walked off the court. I went to the computer. I changed my flights. I came back, did the ceremony, walked off court, then phoned the head of women's tennis back and said, I've changed my flights. And he said, no, hang on a minute. And I was like, I'm coming home. <laughs> and then hung up and I came home. So if you think, I mean, that was the very, very beginning. Yep. I was, all, I mean, it, it, I was always going to have some sort of struggle. So, you know, do I think that, that tennis caused that? N no, because that doesn't really make sense. Um, the life of being a tennis player, I, I love to play tennis to a high level I loved all of the training all of that but being a tennis player and everything else that goes with it um, just never ever suited me no no so there's, there's something around the sport that kind of uh, pushes the buttons that other aspects of life doesn't push it kind of provokes responses it makes us feel more vulnerable particularly in an in a individual sport where the pressure is on people are watching people are funding mm -hmm. um, you know a couple of chats with them a few other players sometimes feeling the pressure of, well, mum and dad are paying for this, I better reach this level. Even if mum and dad are not even saying that, there's, a, there's a, maybe a sense of pushing yourself too far. I, I often wonder what, what, is, what is it around... Is, is, is there something around sport that isn't, is unhealthy in the sense of when, when someone keeps on uh, being driven to keep on winning or need to keep winning, people often say well, they've got great drive. On the flip side of that, that could be seen as being a little bit too obsessive. Yeah. A kind of not life particularly great in balance. Do you think sport very often fosters better not... It doesn't foster a particularly well-balanced view of life if I need to keep on winning to keep on achieving because there's something within me that needs that. Am I not content if I don't have it? Which on the flip side drives you to win the mm. tournaments. On the other side could leave you with quite an empty sense of self. I don't know. Just pausing that one. I think, I, I think it's quite possible. I just feel like... Everybody has different drives and different yeah. reasons for doing things. Um, and there is an obsessive nature to it. I have an obsessive personality. Yeah. I don't have an addictive personality yeah. at all. Um, but I have an obsessive. It's, like a, it's, it's almost like a chosen addiction. Yeah. And I can, I can shift that as I want. Um, but it's just, I think that's probably come out of tennis. Or maybe it's why I was, was, yeah. was involved in tennis. I mean, you know, I've been playing since I was four. It's very difficult to <laughs> unpick what's me yeah. and what's tennis. And I've probably spent, since I retired eight years ago, I've spent the best part of the eight years trying to figure out yeah. who I am rather yeah. than the, the tennis bits. And I, I kind of come to the conclusion yeah. that I can't really do that. Yeah. Like, I am, I am tennis yeah. and, and, and that's, that's it. Um, so it's... Um, it's fascinating. I mean, I mean, look, I, I know this is just such a, an overly used saying in terms of for any sort of mental health and physical health yep. is everything in moderation. Yeah. Um, and to become the best in the world at something, you can't do it in moderation. Yeah, no, and that's just the way that it is. Um, so is and that tension you have to live with or do you need to find a balance in that? Do you just need to acknowledge either this is for a season and I need support structure around me because I'm going to have to go all in and therefore I need to be wise enough to put a structure around me that will support me whilst I go all in? Or is it, do I have to try and find a balance through that? I think, yeah, I think there is a, there, there are, there's a certain amount of time you can put yeah. on, on things. You know, like I was saying, like I don't have five years in me. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. okay with doing this for a couple of years to yeah. get where I want to get to, but I just can't do it for five. Uh, and, you know, after three years I wasn't there, so I was like, right, I'm out. Um, there are some players uh, from my era which were particularly strong on the women's side, yeah. Wozniacki, Radvanska, Corne, these incredible juniors, uh, and they burst through very young, 15, 16. Um, they, their experience, I'm not talking for them, yeah. but in terms of what I viewed from the outside, their experience was that uh, to get to where they got to was unsustainable. Mm. 
but it did the job and then they had to spend some time figuring out how to make their life in tennis sustainable Uh, and that was hard for them Uh, it was very hard and it could have cost them their careers and we've seen it cost a lot of players their careers over 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 the 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 last few generations um there's no there's no right or wrong way they, they just they, there is no right or wrong way because everybody comes from different backgrounds um i mean british players have always been criticized <laughs> hilariously for not being eastern european enough <laughs> uh, i mean that was always coming at me and yeah. i'm like i really don't know what you want me to do about that yeah. i can't i can't help it yeah. um and the eastern th- those players that i just li- listed apart from corne actually but Players like Wozniacki and, and, and Radvanska, they're both Polish. I know Wozniacki plays for Denmark, but she's ultimately Polish. Her dad is Polish and she moved to be Danish. Um, so they have a different attitude yes. and a different approach. It's not a different work. They don't have a better work ethic. They just have a different approach mm-hmm. to things, right? And Djokovic from Serbia, is, his journey has been entirely different to say what yeah. Andy's would have been because he comes from somewhere different. So it's just all about tailoring it to you um, I, I, I think uh, and finding your own part every different way you could ever imagine to get to the top works so for so for your experiences that you've had with sport and mental health and then you now being a coach is there anything from your what your learning has been that you then reflect and apply through through your coaching uh, uh, yes I mean, a, a huge amount, really. I mean, it's all about the person. Um, and it's, this is something that has been changing a lot, actually, recently. The transformation from now... For, I mean, when I had my mental health issues, yeah. I mean, it was just not acceptable. Yeah. It was just, okay, well, you can't be a tennis player then if, you've ha- if you have depression. It's just not possible. Or if you've had it, it's not possible. Um, you're not cut out for it too weak, that sort of thing. And, and, and I'm not pointing fingers at anyone specifically that's just that was the general attitude back then the only athlete I I remember at the time who had ever only British athlete who'd ever said that they struggled with depression was Marcus Treskothic at that time and he'd retired off the back of it so then people said well then look he couldn't do it so yeah Um, but it's um, attitudes are are changing towards it and I think that um, moving forwards it, it People, you just need to be aware of it. Look, if if your kid wants to be a boxer, you've got to be aware that they they might take some brain damage on at some point. Yep. And you've got to be aware of that, try and mitigate it. Yep. If you want to accept that as the risk, because that's what your kid loves to do and wants yep. to do, then fine. And it's a, it's just a similar thing. This is, you know, you might, you're going to have bad knees and hips if yep. you, you Andy Murray. And, and that was something that him and his mum and people okayed and said that's worth it for them. Yep. And, and that's fine. But the, the mental health battles... I mean, really, when you look at it, it, it is actually astonishing. I mean, I'm currently uh, I'm, I'm, I'm embarking on a bit of a project to learn more about what happens to the top kids yep. from 12 when they become average at 16, which they inevitably do because almost all of them do. Yep. Andy Murray, in terms of my life in British tennis, Andy Murray's the only kid who's been great at 12 and has actually gone on to do anything. Everybody yeah, else has seen that is the norm. Everyone then says, that's the norm. Oh, yeah. I want my child to be the best at 12, at 13, at 40. Like, no, no. He was quite rare. Yeah, a complete exception to the rule. Yeah. Complete exception. Um, and uh, and it's fascinating as well, because my brother was the same age as him, right. and they used to they played growing up, and my brother was uh, nearish the top. He wasn't yeah. at the top. He was nearish the top, so they played a lot. And if you saw them hitting up and down the middle, and you said, pick the tennis player, yeah. you would pick my brother every time. Uh, just because you know, he had the perfect technique yep. and the shots and he just looked like a player. He'd play points. I mean, Andy was just tearing him to pieces. <laughs> He'd chop him up, right? Um, but, uh, yeah, it's not... That, that is not... It's not the norm, right? And, I, and I, I, for me, I worry about those players, the ones who are at the top, the yep. youngsters. And you're asking what I've learned and taken into my coaching. I... Look, you can't really control it, but I don't want the players that, that I work with, I don't want any players to be the top players at 11 no. and 12. No. Um, for the f- one reason, if you're looking at it from a performance perspective, is that they never end up being any good. Mm-hmm. It's just a fact, and you can go back and look at it. They just doesn't ha- it just doesn't yeah. happen. Not in this country. It may happen in other countries. It may have happened to Wozniacki. Yeah. But as I say, it's a completely different culture and mentality. Um, because when kids get to 15, 
especially girls, and they've been sacrificing things their whole yeah. life, and they suddenly get other choices and other options, then you know they 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 will make they'll make those choices, and and maybe from different cultures you don't have those things that come in. So my whole attitude has always been: you want to sit in the pack below. Yeah. That that n- next big chunks. So you got like the top five who get loads of funding but they get oh my word so much pressure so much and as you say even if it's unsaid it's unspoken like I always felt pressure when my dad was there and he was the most relaxed sort of guy ever I could come off the court having lost love and love and he'd say did you enjoy that (laughs) and I'd go yeah I just smacked everything into the back fence and he'd go great thanks for wasting my day um but he was super chilled out but still even when I was a pro when I was an adult him being there was just a pressure because I just Mm. so desperately wanted to make him proud and happy and he was so involved in and so invested in my career and had taken me to torments my whole life and that I just wanted it too much and then I forced it and I couldn't play well and then and, and it was really difficult and I had one grass court season where I said to him actually can you not come which is which is awful he didn't take it very well <laughs> I but don't I think he still doesn't understand because all he would ever say was but I don't put pressure on you and uh, trying to explain that I know you don't mean to yeah. and it, as I say the least pressurizing per- parent around but anyway that was um, that is really difficult but so the, the top five, I just think it's, an, it's just an awful place to be. It's just, just horrible. I, I look at the girls from my age group. I know them well now. I mean, they've all had um, difficulties and issues and, and, and very much related to tennis. I think yep. feel like mine are not so much related, yep. um, maybe exasperated, as you were mentioning. Yep. But if you're in the next pack, in the next group of 20 players, which is a lot of players in that one age group, but the next group of 20 players or so, that's where you want to be because you're competing at a high level you're having fun you're probably allowed to go and play the netball match you know (laughs) you're allowed to go to a sleepover and miss a lesson and between christmas and new year that random tournament that's up in sheffield or or god knows where miles and miles away you don't have to go and play it you know you got other brothers and sisters that your parents need to yeah. think about and you can, you can start making those choices people call them sacrifices i call them choices but you yeah. can start making those choices at 15 16 yeah. you don't need to start doing it so early right so that that's kind of what i that's how i view junior tennis at the yeah. moment um but i as i say I'm, I'm embarking on research to try and find out if i'm right i might not be right but that's what i've kind of ascertained anecdotally over the years be fascinating to know please do fill it in it will i imagine it'll be on tennis it will but, uh, but no I, I agree with you one of the reflections that we have is he plays quite a few tournaments and this isn't making an excuse that he he gets beaten quite a bit because but when he gets beat by some of the kids i do look at him and think I'd rather you are you right now than how that child is because there's too much projection on the other child. There was too much. Uh, you could really sense it from the court. You're, you're the man. I'm going back to 1980s shouting golf slogans. You know, you, you know, you got these parents. A lot of pressure of keep the intensity up, and there was a lot of this. Yes, there's competitiveness coming from the other side of the net. But I'm like, oh, all my years in youth work goes. I don't like what you're projecting so much. Mm-hmm. Not that, I, not that I'm getting defensive of my child. I'm like, but if. There's something about your personality that I worry for you when you're in your 20s that I don't necessarily as much worry about for Elijah. Maybe that's because he's horizontal uh, or on most things. But there's something a little healthier when he comes off a court frustrated. And he is frustrated when he gets beaten. He doesn't like it. Uh, <clears throat> but but he gets over it fairly quickly. And yet I've watched other kids who may well win a tournament, but yet there's still some form of projection of, I wonder whether you'll still play this at 16. You seem yeah. to be hitting the ball quite angrily or this is for somebody else it doesn't feel like it's for you yes you're exceptional not making excuses for my boy but if we're talking today about well-being mm-hmm. i'm a little bit concerned about your well-being as a 12 13 year old what you're projecting from your side of the court mm. this is a sport it's got you know your mm-hmm. life is more than that yeah i think if if you took an under let's say under 12 tournament yeah. right that's your your, yeah. your child's at elijah's age uh, if you took an under 12 tournament or even under 12 nationals and you took all of the adults yep. out and you locked them in the clubhouse. <laughs> no windows, dark room. They, they, they got to talk amongst themselves. I mean, there'll be a fight, but let's yeah. not get into that. And you left a the British kids fight, to the... You're passing <laughs> pressure. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly, yeah. There'd just be some ignoring and some, all that sort of stuff. But um, 
if, if you took all of the parents out of the vacinity and they weren't allowed to watch, at under 12, as I say, I have no evidence of this, but just from watching many, many thousands and thousands of matches and children and events week in, week out, and being part of them myself, yeah. a different child would win the tournament. It wouldn't be the ones yeah, that yeah. do. And as you say, because they're doing it for somebody else. And whilst that motivating factor when you're 11 is huge, because when you're 11, your parents are everything. And what they are, what their demands are and their expectations, as I say, even if it's unspoken, even if you've made the assumption as a kid, um, that is such a driving force. Yeah. When you get to 15, 16, you don't care. No. You don't care anymore. No. So you go, actually, I can just tank this match. It doesn't matter. You're going to get mad at me and I'm going to go, what? I don't care. Yeah. And it, it, right? And it, it's different. But then if you, and if, but if you did the same thing at under 18s, mm. in an under 18s event, so Junior Wimbledon. Yep. Junior Wimbledon, if you took, because they're, you know, they're older, obviously, but if you took all of the parents, all of the coaches, no one was allowed to watch. And it was just the kids playing with some referees and that was it. The same person would win the tournament. The same players, the results, the tournament draw, I think, would fill out in a very similar way. Yeah. And at under 12s, I think it is vastly different. Yeah. Because kids don't know what they're doing. And, and it's often the ones like when I was young, I really wanted to go out and play, enjoy myself, and try and do what my coach was telling yeah. me to do. And it, I didn't want to lose. Of course not. I wanted to win. But I... I I would never sacrifice who I was as a player. I was very aggressive and having an aggressive game style to learn how to get it in at such an aggression level, you have to miss a lot, which I did when I was 11, 12, 13. As I say, I would go and lose matches love and love. It was quite regular for yeah. me as because I'd just basically blow out and I'd be playing some hacker and you just blow out and miss everything, right? Um, but I think that's a really interesting thing and I, I think it's a big difference because I, 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 you know, I watch an under 12 tournament and, you, I mean, you could take Tarbs or something, yeah. for example, one of the big European events. Um, you know, and I, I just, I just pr they're probably not going to end up being that good. Yeah. Um, but then if you take Junior Wimbledon, they probably are. Yeah. Because at that l age, they're playing for themselves because they are not quite adults. Yeah. But they know their own minds yeah. a l little bit more, you know, whereas kids are so easily um, pushed around that ultimately they just want to make their parents happy. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's so true. Even if you are trying to do it by the, the good parenting guide of I've remained pan-faced I'm permanently grinning as if I've got trapped wind <laughs> I'm not trying to coach or anything they still do look at you they still just do that quick glance and think I haven't put I don't feel I've said anything I don't feel I put any pressure on you I don't feel I have um, <clears throat> whether I'm aware I have or not might be a completely different question but yet there's still those little glances and, and so for, for us we've just started now to sit further and further back we've got to the point where he still wants us are to you in the up. car yet we're not in the car yet <laughs> but we're, st we're still at that point of i still want you there but i'm like I, i'm it's actually a grieving process because i like being really close i like watching i genuinely like watching for no other reason i just uh, I, yeah. I find sport enjoyable to watch and then when it's your own little and running around you're like well why wouldn't i like that mm -hmm. but i'm now having to put myself further and further back and you notice during games because i'm not there he's not looking to the side to see me to see any reaction mm. uh, and he plays a little bit freer and that, i just have to get over that myself so i miss being closer courtside yeah i, I supplement it with a beer or a coffee in the in the clubhouse further away but i still do wish i was closer to the action yeah but for his sake as he's soon to be 12 and getting older he needs to start playing more for himself absolutely and then, again if you go around and ask all the parents why are you here yeah. why are you watching yeah sometimes both parents come down and sometimes as i say they have other siblings well, what about your other children yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what is going on um, and uh yeah you know, if you ask them all why they are why are you standing right next to this match to watch yeah. it's, it's all for their own reasons yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, they can't do. You can't do anything. You can't talk to the kids. You can't help them. Nope. You can't. You can't do anything. It's a very, very unique sport in that way. There's no other. Sp for me, there's no other sport nope. where you have as little uh, connection. It's actually in the rules that coaching is not allowed, yep. um, which is extraordinary. Um, and I mean, many people will compare it to boxing, as I yep. do, because it's one on one. Yep. It's 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 a real kind of battle out there, gladiatorial nature. Boxers have a chat with their team every three minutes. <laughs> They have a cool down, they have encouragement, they get told yep. to breathe, they get told all of this stuff, you know, it's, um, you know, we just don't get that. I mean, the women obviously get it on their, on their tour once, uh, once a set, but you, you, that's basically once an hour yep. you're, you're looking at it. So it's an extraordinary ask yep. 
uh, for a child. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to move on in a second, just mm. one other question, but uh, one, one funny anecdote that happened with us at a match the other weekend. He was playing someone, and I normally say nothing because I don't really know anything about the sport, so anything I would add would probably be contrary to what we should do. <laughs> but I'd noticed the lad was doing a certain thing and the lad he wasn't picking up, and I just, he's doing that, do this. And he went, I'm playing my game. Okay, I'll just sit yeah. in the back. And part of me was slightly chastised, but then part of me went, good lad, go yeah. stand up for yourself, mate. Exactly. Good lad. No, but that's brilliant. And, you know, I had a very similar thing with what, with the girl that I'm coaching at the moment. This was a f- yeah. quite a few months ago. But one thing, you know, we were talking about confident kids. Um, you know, our, our kids in this nation are, just need so much validation all the yeah, time. Yeah. Uh, and as a coach, you know, I'll ask, I'll ask uh, her, you know, what do you think of that? And she'll say, I think it was good. I mean, it's just guessing. <laughs> You're just guessing at the answer, right? Um, and I and I actually um, and I've I will have sessions, and I'll tell her at the beginning, and I tell the parents, and I say I am withholding all opinion. Yeah. We're not going to mm-hmm. learn anything new in this session, so it's all going to be stuff we've been doing for months, just basic, yeah. staying low, whatever else it is. Uh, we're just going to do that to a high level, and I just want to see what her standards are. And, uh, and it's infuriating for the child and for the parents, basically, to, to be saying, for, for they, they want to know what I think. And I just yeah. say, okay. And she'll, she'll say, yeah, no, it's good. Uh, and I'll say, okay. And I mean, in my head, it's, it's awful. It's just awful. It's so far away from good. And I just think, I just say, okay, great. So are you happy with that? We don't need to do any more? And she'll say, yeah, fine. Um, and anyway, and, and I'm trying to get them the parents and and her to understand that her opinion is the most important because it doesn't matter if my standards are higher than hers because on the match court we have to go by her standards no other standards matter Uh, and if my standards are higher than hers and the parents standards are higher than hers it's irrelevant Um, and then parents get frustrated because they're not meeting their standards but well your child doesn't share your standards so we have to find out what they are and try and nudge them up right and I got to the point where where uh, I asked her, you know, what do you think of that? And she said, yeah, yeah, it was brilliant, because she, she did it brilliantly. She was like, yeah, yeah, it was brilliant, it was brilliant. Um, and I was like, great. And I said, what do you think I thought of that? And she said, um, she says, it doesn't matter. I know it was really good. Good. And it, it, good it's the same thing, right? It's great. You, you should stand up for yourself, because if you are going to embark on this as a, as a career, which she might not, she's only yeah. young, um, and the same for anyone in any walk of life, whatever you're going to do, people are going to tell you yep. you're doing it wrong, you're not doing it well enough, you're not good enough, you're not going to succeed. You have to know your own mind. You've got to know what you're doing, know that you've got a plan, and you have to trust that it's going to work out, uh, even when it's not working out at yep. that time, right? And it's, then, not, it's not a healthy place to be dragged to another level. No, it, exactly. No, exactly. at all. So it, do you have a top tip or top tips uh, that you, through your experience uh, in tennis, would want to impart to us as parents? Kind of this kind of behaviour fosters good mental health. This kind of behaviour fosters good well-being for your child in their sport. Ooh. Is there kind of golden nuggets that you might have. It's a fascinating one because I've, through my coaching career, I mean, I've been learning as well. Yeah. I think it's very easy to say, don't react, don't do anything. Just, you know, just as you say, have that smile, yeah. no matter what's going on. Uh, firstly, I don't think it's realistic. Uh, secondly, I, I think kids see straight through it. Yeah. I don't think there's really any point. He sits next to me at the football. He knows I go up yeah. and down. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and do you know what? It's, it's a roller coaster. And it, but it's a bit the same for me as a coach. If there's yeah. a player that I've been working with for a number of years and I'm invested in, I go on a bit of a roller coaster. I have a slightly different journey um, through the match because I can see that, I suppose I can see the end destination a lot clearer because I've been through it and I've been through it with other players, so you've kind of, yeah. the next, say, three years, I've done that. Parents haven't done it. They can't, they can't, they can't, you, 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 they, they try really hard. They're like, yeah, yeah, no, we, yeah, end result, long-term thinking, all that sort of stuff. Um, but they don't really know what it is. Um, I just don't think that you can try to be a professional tennis player until you are 15. Yeah. I just, I don't care how good you are. Um, I, I've just it doesn't work it, so the, the, fa- the famous thing uh, in any any tennis tournament your kid plays Elijah plays uh, any any grand slam you can't win it in the first round yep. can't win it in the second round you can't win Wimbledon in the first week 
And if you're going to be somebody who's going to be there for the long term, two weeks of five set matches or the end of a long week of, of, it's, it's long, right? You can't win it at the beginning. Um, and I think that as an understanding, but then taking that onto a much larger mm. scale, you cannot be a professional tennis player at 12. No. It's not possible. So don't, A, don't treat them like that, but also don't try to, to do it. Um, I wanted to be a professional tennis player when I was 12. But I wasn't trying to do it. Um, I mean, look, I was as surprised as anyone that I ended up being a professional tennis player. But that's the, that's the thing. Uh, and when I was talking about the system, th those top, that top group, the five who yeah. are kind of, they've been picked out and they're going to be professional tennis players. The parents are making them into professional tennis players. Yeah. The federation are, everything is, it, that's all it's going to be. I mean, it's not going to work. I've never seen it work. No. It, it's just not going to work. So I, I just think you kind of need to get rid of that and just allow kids to play and to compete. Um, it's a fantastic. The stuff that you can learn, the life skills that you can learn. If you are a kid who has trouble with their emotions when they're playing tennis mm. and they go and you know, they're 10, 11 years old and, and they get too angry and they slam a ball out or they might smash a racket or whatever uh, might go on and they can't control it. If by the age of 16 they have learned how to control that, well, yeah. what a phenomenal yes. opportunity that has been for your child to learn how to control their emotions in extremely pressurized situations. Now, if they go on to be a doctor, a lawyer, exactly. a teacher, a postman, anything, they'll be able to deal with that. So what an, what an amazing thing yeah. they've done. Um, and there are so many uh, things that you can get from tennis resilience. And as I say, it's the ultimate test of who you are. Um, and that's fantastic. And you know what? If we were all just doing that, then some professional tennis players would pop out of it. Um, but, but they never come from where you expect them to come no. from. I mean, come on, Rafa's from Mallorca. It's not like they've got a tennis program. No. Uh, well, they do now with the Rafa Academy, right? <laughs> he's, he's created one. And Fed, Fed and, and yeah. Vavrinka from Switzerland. Yeah. You can't tell me that the Swiss structure for the past 30 years has been so good. They, they've yeah. brought up multiple slam champions. And, and Andy from Dunblane, I know he went yeah. to, to Spain for a little bit of time. But and Jamie. And Jamie, yeah. of course. And, you know... The players just come out of nowhere. Yeah. Venus and Serena from Detroit. You, it's just, it's not a, um, th th there, are no, there are no secrets to it. You can't guess at it. I mean, I mean you, well, you kind of can, because I watched Andy at 12. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we all knew he was going to be a professional tennis player. But as I say, that is just such an exception to the rule. I mean, we're talking top, top end, but the, the, the vast majority of professional tennis players are ranked between 20 and 100. Mm. Um, and... Uh, yeah, it, it, it's just, uh, but that is a very difficult thing to do. I think understand what your, your child can get out of tennis. Um, and uh, and that, that's just the, the best approach. There, there is so much they can get out of tennis by playing to a high level. So yes, I think it's good that they are pushed and that they push themselves yeah. and that you seek out good coaching and that you want them to play yeah. to a high level because each level brings with it new lessons, yeah. new yeah. life lessons. It's going to prepare them for life. Um so I, I love all of that, and I, but I just, yeah, I just, uh, just take out that I want my child to be a professional tennis player because that, for me, it, it, I mean, when people say that to me, uh, they either are asking for, for coaching or for advice or help or, or questions, and they'll say something like, you know, my, my child wants to be a professional tennis player. You know, what, what do we do? What do, we do? Uh, my, my answer normally is prove it. Well, I don't say prove it. But in my head, I say prove it, and I'll I'll say I'll say to them, okay, right, let's do a little trial run, two months. I'll see them twice a week or whatever. Um, here's what I'd like you to do: uh, three times a week, out on the court serving. Um, also, need to be I don't know, do something else, something else, and pick a few other things. It, it's not. It's not that that's going to make them into a professional tennis player. It's just I'm asking them to prove it. Like you, you have no idea what I've done in my life nope. and what I've been through. Um, and we, we're talking about slightly older kids now. We're talking yeah. about 13, 14 year olds, fift even 15 year olds, yeah. when you can start choosing. And uh, uh, I mean, they almost always don't do it. So, because because the trouble is, is that being a professional tennis player is not, as you said to me, the match I played at, Wim at, at Wimbledon against Venus. That's not being a professional tennis player. Yeah. It's the five years of being on the circuit yeah. and the training and getting up at six o'clock in the morning and not being able to go to weddings and fr and friends yeah. things and this sort and, and and everything that your life is and being permanently jet lagged and 
uh, being away for Christmases or whatever else it is. Um, it's um, that's what being a tennis player is and I always just think if you sat down and talked to me for an hour about what I did and what you would have to do as a parent you'd say maybe we'll just play for fun I don't know <laughs> bank manager sounds like a good career for you so, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, last quick, uh, two last quick questions mm. um, if p- parents are listening which uh, is the aim of the podcast so if they're not it's best to stop um if people are listen, uh, parents are listening and uh, wondered, are there any support organisations out there if they do have concerns for their child's well-being, um, particularly around mental health? Is there anything attached, uh, anything to, with sport or anything like that that maybe there could be people to turn to for advice or support structures for their for their kids if they're struggling? Yeah, well, I, I can tell you that uh, the L, I've been working with the LTA. Yep. Uh, I, I, mean, I am the British. Ten, I am a British tennis mental health ambassador. There's one more as well, uh, Ollie Jones. But uh, we've been working on a, a website site page with lots of information uh, there's gonna be a video of me chatting about a few bits and bobs I think chatting about the Venus match that yeah. sort of stuff um, with lots of information um, but really um, you know there are uh, fantastic charities uh, all around there's a lot of local charities as well depending on where you are yeah. regionally I suppose um, but uh, but mind is a very yeah. very strong charity yeah. um, it, and it also depends what what you're dealing with uh, beat is a great organization I've worked a lot with them with eating disorders um, which is something that is astronomically high in, in yeah. tennis uh, crazy uh, for, for both boys and girls um, uh, and again uh, players who tend to uh, at Kids and athletes who tend to play tennis tend to be control freaks because they don't want to play in a team. They don't want to share things. They want it all to be their own, th- their own thing. They want to be in control all the time. Like I was saying about a teammate taking a penalty. That's not for me. No. Um, uh, eating disorders centre so much around control, yes. um, and so that's why we see such such high numbers of it. Uh, so Beat is a fantastic organisation for that. But um, and I'll put the links for these on the on the podcast. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, but as I say, uh, definitely. Uh, early 2019 there will be uh, uh, pages on the LTA website with um, all those uh, all, all of the links and, and just some information and that yeah. sort of stuff but the, the number one thing is if you have any serious concerns you get professional help yeah, yeah. if you have to think about it like it's physical health yeah. and do you know what if your kid has got signs of flu uh, but they're also presenting signs of meningitis you don't sit at home and decide whether they've got flu or meningitis. You take them to a professional to decide whether it's flu or meningitis. So if you have a teenager who is showing signs of depression, but it could also just be teenagery stuff, you're not qualified to decide what it is and a professional will be able to decide whether it is an illness or whether it is teenagery. Sorry, you're going to have to put up with this for a couple more years. <laughs> Then, then the help needs to come to the parents. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what does uh, 2019 hold for you? Anything big, anything significant? Uh, well, well, I mean, in my personal life, I'm getting married. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> so that's where a lot of the focus is. It's going to be a week after Wimbledon, so it'll be quite the month, <laughs> I, I, I can assure you. Um, lots of commentating, right. uh, which is going to be fantastic. As I say, I'm, I'm doing a lot of work within, uh, within mental health. Uh, I do work with the Federation, improving um, awareness and understanding, communicating with players. Uh, also, as, you said, as I was mentioning, some research into you know, what is happening to our youngsters when they get older, yep. uh, when they move away from the sport, what, what becomes of them, because nobody seems to know. Um, and, uh, and yeah, just watching an awful lot of tennis <laughs> is going to be it. you're traveling around I'll be going out to plenty of tournaments kicking off of course Australia season in, in January uh, yeah working really hard it's going to be a busy one if you need anyone, any help in carrying bags uh, I'm sure <laughs> I can be available particularly for the Aussie one I've got big bags <laughs> I don't know if you'll be you'll be happy with that well, well, all the very best in 2019. And um, as you've already sampled at the beginning, I'm available for catering for your wedding. Okay, As long good. as it's um, overly buttery shortbread. Overly buttery shortbread. Do you know what? I think it will go down well. And of course, I should mention, I'll be killed if I don't. Of course, we're going to be tennising exactly. for our podcast. We're kicking that off again in January. So, And that, that's just general chit-chat, much like we've just done now. You know, general, general chit-chat about the world of tennis. Lots of laughs. It's, it's more than general chit-chat. It, it, is, it is a good <laughs> laugh. I've been regularly found on the train in my uh, commute whenever I'm in London, smirking or laughing, much to the amusement of very silent commuters. <laughs> so thank you. That. Brilliant. So, so Naomi, thank you so much for joining us in, in Pret and on Courtside. Thank you. And have a good 2019. Well, I will, thank you. <laughs> Wimbledon, 
So welcome to the uh, courtside post-match reflections with Kath, who's now grinning away, going, oh, crumbs, here we go again. <laughs> it's 2019, and I still have to do this. So what did you think of uh, that podcast? I'm now, you know, interviewing the stars, tennis commentator. Well, all I can say is you've never made me shortbread. No, that's true. So I'm not very happy. Having said that, you did leave me the edges, which were a bit burnt. <laughs> So thank you for that. My New Year's offering. So there we go. Clearly, that's how our marriage will be panning out for the rest of the year. But you get the off cuts, and Naomi gets the last. Yeah, yeah. So I see how this works. But um, yeah, no, it was a great, great podcast. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, What I love about Naomi, she's got a great voice. She has really, really easy to listen to as well. Um, But belies her age. She doesn't sound like her her age with her voice. But yeah, really, really easy listening. I think uh, definitely one of those takeaway phrases as well that I like was the uh, why are you here that question to parents isn't it yeah. uh, for me I think as you sort of reflected about Elijah at this stage he we needing to sort of start to stand back now um, and I think sometimes it's a good question to ask ourselves isn't it why are we here and actually whose benefit is it for mm. us being on the court side is it for us or for him um, and I guess being mindful of that this year yeah. would be uh, a really healthy starting point. Yeah, I, I like the the part. I think sometimes in tennis we often talk about you know what level do you think you'll get as a as a as a player. So do you think my child will become number one? Or all these kind of questions. But there was something interesting I reflected on as I listened back on to the interview was it was about knowing your emotional makeup more. It wasn't mm-hmm. because you wonder where Naomi could have got to mm. if she hadn't retired at twenty one and it would imply that she could have made the top 100 with the the way she was playing it then and obviously a phenomenal match with uh, Venus but there was something about the interview where she kept on saying but I knew I didn't have that in me Mm. and some could look at that and say that's a weakness but I'd look at that and say that's a strength because that's a real awareness she knew who she was Mm. and part of her emotional makeup what makes her her was saying the journey further into this tennis isn't intrinsically who I am mm. and there's a real strength in owning I love and you know we chatted for an hour after the interview she adores this sport she mm. lives and breathes it it's not like she fell out of love with the sport so she held within her own life that tension of I love this sport but I know that the journey to be in being a professional player isn't me yeah and I think there's uh, I guess a refreshing honesty there and real understanding of, of what it takes isn't it yeah. and, that, and that conversation around you know the five-year yeah. window of time and how you know that potentially may get longer isn't it for players that have to to really work hard and it's all the unseen yeah. stuff that you know we're just totally unaware of isn't yeah. it what goes on the travel the demands and things like that and I think you know there's a real honesty as you say in self-awareness isn't it that actually she went with a very clear mindset that she wanted this but actually got to a point and thought well actually if this is what it's going to ask of me as a person personality this this isn't who I am and that's a really brave thing to do and um but equally good that people can make those choices and I think you know as I reflect for my role supporting young people making choices after sixth form about what they're going to do uh, and what that next step is you know really what I try and instill in them is that sense of self and who they are as a person because yeah. we can't control we don't know what the next steps look like all the time and the very few have a clear pathway but for the majority we don't but it's that having trust that it's going to work out yeah. and actually going for their their dreams and aims and yes lots of people will say oh it's not going to work out or are you sure about this and what's your plan b but actually instilling in them a trust in themselves mm. that it will work out um but being prepared that plan a might turn yeah. into b c d yeah. Um, and so that's really healthy honesty and, to hear. Yeah, not every parent who listened to this, their child is looking at the same path that Naomi went on. Mm. Uh, but for those who are, are we making them fully aware of what the journey ahead really will look like? Or are they still seeing, and Naomi kept on saying, you know, the, the top when you're 12 isn't necessarily the top when you're 16. Mm. Andy Murray, it wasn't Yaki, they are rare. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and that's not the norm. And, and are we being honest enough with our kids to say, if that's a land of travel you want to go, this really is the reality of it? Because mm. what we watch on telly is the highlights. What we watch on telly is the glory moments. But behind that, do you really want to go through that grind? Mm. And if not, that's not you giving up on your sport. That's you being true and honest to who you are. But And that's a really tricky one, isn't it? Because, you know, even when people 
you know, we had in our head, oh, yes, we'll have children and la, la, la. But actually, even if someone told us what the reality was like, <laughs> I don't think we'd have ever got our heads around that or yeah. thought it through or not. And so until you're in it, it's very hard, isn't it? Yeah. So I think what you can do is is develop their skills and their qualities and personal qualities, isn't it? So that when they're in those situations, they, they handle that as well as they can do. Because yeah. I just think it doesn't matter what we say, they will... Or Elijah, in it, our case, isn't it? Will forge his own path. He will. Um, so I think that's a tricky one, isn't it? To give them a heads up yeah. because he can only think beyond the next ten minutes of his life at this stage. So I'm not. Hopefully, he can think beyond the next month. So uh, yeah. Yeah. So I th- I, so I, I just wanted to kind of leave that podcast there with uh, that. They were my main reflections on it. Really, it was that honesty of um, it uh, success in the sport can also be knowing who I am enough to know that that route in the sport it genuinely isn't me and that's not me giving up that's not me being weak uh, that's not me being committed but it's a true sense of this is me therefore this path is more likely to be me because obviously you can tell when chatting with her and then obviously afterwards she loves being a commentator she still loves her sport she came mm-hmm. very alive as she talked about it, very animated as she chatted mm-hmm. and so you can tell that she's really where she should be that is a true expression of who she is mm-hmm. yeah Classically, when people do particularly well in sport, there is this one line that I guess we presume our kids will go on. And if they don't, they've dropped out the sport, which isn't true. They haven't dropped out the sport. They've remained true to who they are. Mm. Sorry, are you finished? I'm not finished. Okay, you are can you keep finished? going. No, I thought I was, but then I'm going off on one again as <laughs> usual. Yeah, I was going to say. but and, and I think there was those couple of um, phrases as well. She talked about choices, not sacrifices. So that yeah. was in relation to, you know, that 15-year-old, you know, being able to have that ability to, to not go to that match over Christmas and things. But people seeing that as a sacrifice, but actually being very intentional in the language we use that actually you still have choice in this um and also I think a little bit like you were saying there that that validation is really important and that confidence um and I think that's the one thing we can do well as parents is really support our son in that and and validating him but equally you know I'm often saying oh and how was that you know and how did you feel that went and actually I'm putting my standards and I thought that was good how she said you know what's the child's standard and viewpoint on something Mm -hmm. but using that gentle nudge um, to support them to grow as well as opposed to me setting a level of standards which are probably totally inaccurate (laughs) (laughs) because mine would be uh, the Olympics in about 18 months but there we go that's That's, me outworking my own Sporting inadequacy. No, you know, I remember those days when you played at Wimbledon. You're just projecting your own standards that you once had. <laughs> Wimbledon Park. That's right, Wimbledon yeah. Park. But now the, the <clears throat> I think the, the other bit, because it was such a rich interview. Are I, you still I, talking? I am now? not, because it's such a rich interview. There's loads. The other bit that popped into my head was wondering whether it's better to be in the chasing pack. Mm. Because, uh, you know, if you're number one too young, you, you've got everything to lose where there was that kind of celebration of I've got a target to aim for, I've got a pursuit to go for, and I can still hang out with my mates, whereas all of a sudden too much success too early, Mm. it might be too much pressure. I just thought that was interesting. The number ones at 12 are invariably not the number ones at 18. That's the stuff I'm always rattling around in my head. Mm. And so if you've got that through data, it validates what the coaches keep on talking about, about process. Mm. And uh, that, I mean, there's the big bit in Andy Murray's autobiography where he constantly talks about chasing his brother, Mm. because Jamie's older. Uh, and I think Judy talks about that a bit as well. She wonders whether that's how Andy got to being number because he was always chasing because his brother was always bigger, he was mm. always better, he was always faster. And then Andy was always pursuing to try and mm. uh, bridge that gap. Whereas if you're Jamie, you've you've just trying to fend off your brother. Mm, yeah. And I think last thing, last thing, definitely. This, really is last this thing, is yeah, the yeah. last thing. Um, New, Year's, New Year's resolution. Yeah, exactly. The last thing. Um, I think. I think certainly for for me in my work context, isn't it? When she was talking about um, Naomi was talking about the those who are successful or or doing well in whatever they're doing, isn't it? And high achieving, whatever field that is, actually their susceptibility to mental health and expectations and I think it's very easy certainly in a school context we talk very much about the very vulnerable students are the ones with SEN and yes that's certainly the case but actually I think sometimes we forget that or I do that actually that other group um the high achievers as well 
yeah that actually there's a, a massive expectation and pressure on them and they are equally susceptible um and to be very aware of that um but i think they may mask it in a very different way so yeah which isn't necessarily just always external pressure from mum and dad it's internal mm. i want to keep yeah. on winning and where does my validation come unless i keep on getting straight A's? Mm. and they are they're not necessarily seen as vulnerable because they're always seen as getting yeah. accolades yeah 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 so i thought it was healthy my, my final bit back would be to oh, Naomi. Come on. No, this is a thanks. This is a thanks to Naomi because this is what, episode 13, 14? And I'm kind of still new at this. And one of my reflections back on the whole interview is I coughed less during this interview. Oh. So regular listeners will be aware of my annoying little cough tick thing, which genuinely is a nervous tick because this is me being a little bit vulnerable doing the podcast. It's not quite my norm. Uh, and kind of hanging out with Naomi, I noticed pretty early on in the interview, I stopped my nervous tick. So. She is very good at this whole interviewing thing and, and even made me, the interviewer, relaxed. So huge thanks to Naomi and all the best with this coming year. And uh, to all of you as courtsiders, I hope you have a fantastic 2019, that all your dreams come true and all the rest of that. Was that a little bit too Hollywood and Disney-fied there? Probably, yeah, because mine answer? would mean Elijah would play at Wimbledon next year, but, you know, that's unrealistic. Okay. Am that, I off on one again? You're off on yeah, one again. My I'm unrealistic fun- world. <laughs> Have a fantastic 2019 and thank you for joining us. Please do spread the word about the podcast. That is if you feel the word needs to be spread by it. And uh, uh, let's get many more listeners over 19 just following us and uh, joining in on this journey as being courtside parents. Happy New Year.